Uh, we are in our summer of the Psalms, our summer of the Psalms, and um, I'm really excited about, about this series. I've been, I've been pouring through the Psalms, and it's such, such a rich, rich uh, spiritual resource that God's given us. And uh, just for review, uh, last week uh, we went over Psalm 84, and in Psalm 84, David talked about the value that he had for God's presence and the blessings that come from God's, God's presence. And we discovered that there were three um, things that were necessary for the blessing of God's presence to be experienced. And that was that we had to spend time with God. We had to spend time with God. And that we had to uh, find our strength in God rather than relying on my strength, my ability, my intellect, my reason, my resources to try to solve the issues and problems of life. I'm depending on God's strength. And then ultimately we had to trust God. Trust has to do with yielding and surrendering and letting go. Like you're sitting down in that bench. You are trusting that bench to uphold you. you you're, you're trusting that. You're not thinking twice about, was it going to collapse? Is it going to fall? Was it gonna... No, you, you, you have yielded. When you sat down, you yielded to that bench. And, and that's the picture of what happens when we are able to spend time in God's presence. We're able to rest in his strength. We're able to rest and know he got our back. Whatever we're facing, he can, he can handle it because we can. Amen? Today, I want to talk to you about having victory in fearful times. Victory in fearful times. How, how many of us have ever gone through seasons of fearful times? Well, we're going to be coming out of Psalm 27, and I'm going to read uh, Psalm 27 in its entirety. Uh, it's uh, 14 verses um, as our opening framework, and then we're going to uh, come back and break our text down. Amen. So Psalm 27, starting with verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble... He will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. But I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Father, we wait on you to come and to impart spiritual life and spiritual nourishment. Holy Spirit, 
We are in need of the activation and the manifestation of your gifts of teaching and exhortation. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, heart to receive, Lord. Make your word to be like fire and our hearts to be like wood that we would be consumed in its hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Victory in fearful times. Fear starts when you're young. We grow up and we're fearful of things like the darkness. I have been accused of being afraid of the dark, uh, but I am just uncomfortable in the dark. Uh, we're fearful of the boogeyman, the monsters under the bed, and then fear continues as we become teenagers, right? We grew up, we were fearful of ridicule, we were fearful of rejection, we were fearful of resisting peer pressure, and then we become adults. And then fear becomes a whole nother level as adults. We become fear of disease and fear of financial problems and fear of broken relationships, fear of being left alone, fear of dying. Fear, anxiety, and worry can rob us of the joy and the peace that God wants us to have. They can become very harmful to us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. As David writes this 27th Psalm, he is going through one of the most fearful times in his life. Now, you know the story of David. David was a shepherd boy, and David was anointed to be king. He was just a shepherd. He wasn't any of the special people. He wasn't in the special crowd. And when the prophet came to David's house, and he asked David's father, um, where are all your sons? And he brought out all the sons. He brought them all out but David. And then when the prophet turned the horn of oil, over top of the heads of the sons, and if the oil came out, it would signify that that was the one that God selected. The prophet went through all of the sons, and the oil didn't come out. And the prophet asked, well, you know, I know God sent me. He said, there's a king here. I don't, I don't win all your sons. Are, are, are there any others? He said, yeah, we got one more, but, but he's out in the field. David wasn't even worthy of being considered as qualified. So David gets anointed king, and then you know the story of David and, and Goliath, and Israel is up in the battlefield against this mighty giant Goliath. Nobody wants to go out and take on Goliath, but this little kid who's walking in his anointing, he goes out, and with five smooth stones, he takes out the giant with one hit. And if you remember, after David killed Goliath, the nation exalted him. Saul, the king made David a general in his army. Not only did he make him a general in his army, those of you who are here who are fathers and you have, you have daughters, you can appreciate this. He not only made him a general in the army, he let him marry his daughter. Boy, he liked David. He loved David. David was the toast of the town. This is the one that killed Goliath. And then in the battles that Israel would have with the Philistine army following that, David was a victorious general. And the crowds, the nation, came up with a song. And the song said, David, Saul killed a thousand, but David killed 10,000. And then all of a sudden, Saul became salty. Saul started hating. Saul started devising ways to kill David. And so David goes from being the toast of the town from being elevated and celebrated to now David is running for his life. He didn't ask to be king. He didn't ask to be elevated. But now he's running for his life from Saul. He's hiding in caves. He's on the run. He's, on, he's, he, he's being pursued and tracked down. He runs from caves to tabernacles. There was one time when, when David ran to the temple to, to try to find refuge in the temple, and he couldn't stay there long, and he had to leave and run. And Saul found out that the priest in the temple had gave refuge to David, and Saul had all the priests killed. David writes this psalm when he has real serious fears to contend with. While David was on the run, his best friend, 
was a guy named Jonathan. And Jonathan was the son of Saul. And while they were on the run, they connected. And David pours out to Jonathan a very real fear that he had in the midst of this circumstances. Look at what he says in 1 Samuel 23. David says, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, there is only one step between me and death. David is living at fearful times. And David's fears are real and it's legitimate. As we study this psalm together, what I want us to do is what can we learn from David about how to deal with fearful times? What, 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 what can we learn about what should our response be to the very legitimate fears and sometimes illegitimate fears that we have? You know, there's, a, there's an acronym for, for, for fears uh, that uh, we use in the, in, 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 in the, in the Pentecostal circles. Fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. So we have very real fears, and then sometimes we have fears that we've made up, or not so much that we've made up, but that we've given more power to than we should. So as we look at this psalm, there's two thoughts that I want us to focus on. Um, one is the cause of our fears. What is the cause of our fears? Where, 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 where do they come from? There is an inevitability of having fearful times. It's inevitable, right? There will be, not might be, there will be times when we will all face fearful circumstances in life. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, when, when. Look at what Psalms 27 verse 2 says here. It says, when the wicked advance against me, it is my enemies and my foes. It is a reality that we are going to experience fearful times. We live in a very fearful and dangerous world. Tragedy, sickness, disease, injury, in, injury disaster, death can come on us at any time. Life can turn on a dime. How many people have we known? Who were, the, everything was good, everything was fine, and then on a dime, here comes a report from the doctor. On a dime, here comes a tragedy. On a dime, life can turn at any minute. It's not if, it's when. This, this is what happened to David. This is what David was experiencing. Look at these verses here on the screen. Look, 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 look at all the things that David was facing. He was facing evil men. He was facing enemies. He was facing armies who was besieging him. There was trouble surrounding him. His parents rejected him. Remember, his father didn't even bring him out when he brought out his other sons. And he had all of these false witnesses that were lying against him. Anybody ever felt that way? You got folk lying on you. You felt like there's forces and oppositions that are against you that seem to be overwhelming you and that you are surrounded by all sides. Some of us feel that way from things external to us in our environment. Some of us feel that thing from even in our own household. Even from those who are closest to us. Everywhere David turned, he saw potential danger, destruction, and violence. While it's possible for us to escape fearful circumstances altogether as Christians, you and I don't have to live every day in fear. We can't escape them, but we don't have to live every day in fear, anxiety, apprehension. We don't have to. What is the cure? What is the cure for our fears? What is the cure? Notice when David starts this psalm, he, he, he doesn't begin the psalm talking about his troubles. He, he, he talks about that and he starts in verse 2. But in Psalm 1, he begins with praising God rather than focusing on the problems. You see, anytime you and I find ourselves in 
fearful situations, we can respond in one of two ways. One of two ways. We can focus on our problem and be overcome with fear, or we can focus on God and overcome our fears. We can focus on the problem because, listen, whatever you focus on, you magnify. Whatever you magnify, you enlarge in your life. You give more power to in your life. So if you focus on your fears, you magnify, enlarge, and give more power to your fears. If you focus on God, you magnify, enlarge, and give more power for God to operate in your life. What is it that you are focusing on? Because you know how it is with them fears. You know how it is. Late in the midnight hour, you be up 2 o'clock in the morning, you can't even sleep. You close your eyes, you try to sleep, your body is tired, but that fear keeps working. That fear keeps talking. And you focus on that and you meditate on that in the people. Why are they doing me like this? Why are they doing me like this? And that thing just gets bigger and bigger and bigger rather than focusing on God. Look what David says in our text that he provides for us as the cure for fearful times. What's the cure? First thing he says as our cure is we need to trust in God's presence. We need to trust in God's presence. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Have you ever noticed what happens when you turn on the light? You ever, you ever notice how comforting is light? is in darkness because when you're going through fearful times sometimes it feels like a dark season like darkness is all around you but when you just turn on the light when you walk into a dark room what's the first thing you do you feel around for that light switch light dispels darkness but light also dispels our fears david found himself surrounded by the darkness of trouble and danger but it was the light of the lord's presence that he used to drive away the fear. The obstacles were real. Was Saul out to get him? Yes. Did Saul sick his armies after him? Yes. Was David literally on the run for his life? Yes. But he did not allow the fears to overwhelm him because he found that in God's presence there was light. And not only that, salvation, deliverance, rescue, you see, in fearful times, people try to find salvation in a lot of things. When we're going through fears, people try alcohol and drugs. They turn to doctors who can prescribe pills to calm their fear and their anxieties. Today, fear-driven anxiety disorder is one of the most common mental illnesses in the U.S. It affects 40 million adults. That's one in five people are on medication because of fear-driven anxiety. They have no light. They have no source of salvation in the midst of the darkness of fears. And so they turn to prescription drugs. There's an old wide saying that goes like this. No Christ, no peace. And oh, no Christ, no peace. But if you know Christ, K N O W, then you will know peace. No Christ, no peace. No Christ. Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto the Lord. And then watch this. And then the God of all peace shall guard your hearts and your minds through. Christ Jesus. David knew the Lord, therefore, he knew where to turn to find peace in the midst of his fears. First thing we do to find a cure for fearful times is we have to trust in God's presence. David said that in God's presence is there's light and there's salvation. Second thing that we have to do to find a cure for fearful times is we have to learn to trust in God's protection. Learn to trust in God's protection. 
Look at the second part of that verse in, in, in Psalm 27, 1. He said, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? The, 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 the stronghold, the word stronghold here is a military term. It refers to a fort or a fortress. A stronghold is a place of walled protection and safety and security that cannot be penetrated by the enemy. A stronghold. The Lord is my light. He dispels fear of darkness. He is my salvation. He ultimately will rescue me. He is the stronghold, the place of protection, a walled place of security that my enemies can't breach. Yeah, they may be coming. Yeah, they may be saying things. Yeah, they may be doing things. But as I hide myself in the Lord's presence, he protects me. What is it that he protects? Because you may very well have to deal with some external things on the outside. So what is it that he protects? He protects your mind. He protects your heart. He protects your sanity. Because that's the worst part about going through fearful times. The anxiety that comes and messes up your mind. You ain't got no peace. He protects that. He guards that. He surrounds your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. You know, people try to do a lot of things to find protection for themselves when they're fearful and anxiety. We already talked about they try to medicate themselves. We're one of the most over-medicated societies in the world. Some people put dead bolts on their doors. They find iron or chain link fences all around their home. Some folks sloop with a loaded pistol. Some buy rockwallers or pit bulls. Some carry pepper spray and tasers. I remember when my daughter was down at Temple, I used to say, listen, you better get you some, better get you some pepper spray and the taser. Hit him with the one, two. All of these things that we do when we are fearing fearful to try to provide security and protection for ourselves. David understood that ultimately in fearful times, his protection was coming from the Lord. That God was the stronghold and fortress that he needed to hide himself in. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Watch as, as he continues. He says, one thing I've asked from the Lord. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? Because it's my place of protection. And remember, when we, last week, when we talk about dwelling in the house of the Lord or or, 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 or or the tabernacle of the Lord. We're really talking about God's presence. And when we talk about God's presence, we, we're really talking about something that is sourced from the inside out, that God abides here, that we engage God in a spiritual realm. It's a place where we sit still before God and we encounter his presence, his, his, his spiritual reality in our lives that lifts us up and above and beyond the physical circumstances and situations that we are facing. He says, all I want to do is dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To engage on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To engage in the beauty of the Lord. In other words, to realize, to, cert to, to discern, to experience God's beauty, his holiness, the thing that makes God, God. For it, why? Why does he want to do this? He says, for in the day of trouble, what will he do? In the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. I need to get to God. I want to spend time with God. Why? Because when my fearful times come, when it's going on around me, I'm being besieged and folks are lying about me, talking to me, and I got pressures and I got all this anxiety, I know that as I dwell with God as I encounter his presence, he will keep me safe. Watch this. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. In other words, he will mentally and emotionally elevate me above the circumstance and situations. I won't be operating in the chaos. I won't be driven by the chaos. I will be operating above the chaos. Y'all go ahead on with that. I ain't, that, that ain't, that ain't, I ain't sweating that. I, I ain't sweating that. He is not going to cause me to be tripping today. Nope, I ain't going with that. I'm elevated. I'm set upon a rock. 
that, that, that gives a picture of sturdiness and stability and elevation over the problems and the challenges. David trusted in God's protection. David has people pursuing him to literally take his life. David's fears and anxieties were real. What fear, what anxiety is real to you today? What is it? What are you trusting to elevate you above that? What are you trusting to give you security and protection? David understood. David was convinced that God's presence, he could trust in it because God was a light and salvation and that God was the stronghold. God had his back. God would fight his battles. Third thing that we learn from this psalm about what to do in fearful times. David trusted in God's perfect timing. David trusted in God's perfect timing. I remember when I first got saved, uh, my mom had recommended that I needed to do something with my time now. So I had joined the uh, men's choir at the church back then. Uh, and they were part of the Pennsylvania Male Singing Association. And we were wearing three-piece suits and red bow ties back then, and three-piece suits and red bow ties, were not in, they, were, they weren't in style. <laughs> but we used to sing this song. You can hurry, God. Oh, no, you just have to wait. You have to trust him and give him your time, no matter how long it takes. Job said, Lord, you put the sickness upon me, so won't you come and see about me? You see, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Well, you can't hurry, God. Oh, no, you just have to wait. You have to trust him and give him your time, no matter how long it takes. That's the song that David is singing right here. David is saying that I have to trust God in his perfect timing. When the fearful times come, and all the things that the fearful times embody, the circumstances, the situations, the individuals, the anxiety, when that stuff is on you, it's natural to want to just escape it right then and there. Absolutely. Who wants to be stressed? Who does? It, it's natural to want to, like, like, Lord, deliver me now. Pastor Jones was talking all that light and salvation. I want some of that salvation right now. But David, David ran for over seven years from Saul. That's a long time to be running. David trusted in God's timing. There's a verse in the New Testament that says that God will never put more on you than you can bear. Right? No temptation coming from you except that which is common to man. And in every temptation, God will give you a way out. Watch this. God will give you a way out. Well, what's the way out? That you can bear it. The way out isn't complete escape. That's what we want. We want, we want the escape hatch. He says, no, I'm going to give you the capacity to do what? To bear that thing. Why? Because in the bearing, strength is made. You go to the gym, and you see the guys in there with the big muscles, Right? They got big muscles because of what they're bearing. They're pushing weight. I was in the gym, and I was doing reps with 15 pounds. And all the guys, they throw them big, heavy weight, and they over there laughing. And I was like, I'm going to keep working with these 15 pounds. <laughs> y'all can, can say what y'all want to say. They walking around all like this. But you can bear it. See, 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 God knows that spiritual vitality and spiritual strength cannot be developed in an environment of ease. I want you to think about this for a moment. Let's step back for a moment. When God anointed David to be king, 
when he was out there in the field minding his own business, he ain't asked to be king. He was out there mining, mining the flock like he was supposed to, right? And God selected him to be king. At the moment God selected David to be king, do you think God might have known that a few years later Saul would be tripping? You think God might have known, might have had an inclination that Saul was going to be tripping, that David was going to be running for his life for all of those years? Yeah, I think so. You think if God knew that about David, do you think when God called you into his kingdom, when God answered your cry for salvation and brought you in, do you think the fearful times, the anxiety, and the causes of the fear and anxiety that you're experiencing now, do you think that's taking God by surprise? You think God was sitting up in heaven and saying, oh my God, I don't believe that they, I don't believe they did that to her. I don't believe, oh my Lord, can you believe that? I am shocked. No, he knew. So here's the question then. If he knew, why didn't he stop it? That's a fair question, isn't it? If he knew, why didn't he stop it? Well, Let's go back to the picture of the bodybuilder. The bodybuilder's muscles are big because he's trained himself to bear weight. You look at someone that's never trained themselves to bear weight, they all puny, arms all, all skinny, right? Because they've never borne any weight. God allows the fearful times and circumstances to come so that we would be like David and turn to God. Trust in his presence, trust in his protection, trust in his timing, that he could give us the capacity while he works it out, that we can bear it, and in bearing it, we develop spiritual strength, strength of faith, strength of resilience and perseverance, right? That's why Peter says, think it not strange these fiery trials which must come your way. For the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience, perseverance, the ability to wait, to endure. Therefore, let, let patience have its, watch this, let patience have its perfect work. So there's a work that the trials are intended to produce. Let patience have its perfect work. Well, why? God, why do I need to wait? So that you may be thoroughly complete, lacking nothing. David 1,500 years, well, 500 years before that verse was ever written in Peter, David understands the importance of waiting for God's perfect timing. Look what he says in verse 13 and 14. He says, I remain confident. Think about this. Think about the use of this phrase in the midst of all that David is, is, is experiencing, all that's going on in David's life. He uses the word confident. You run it for your life. The whole nation is out to get you. Everywhere you run, everywhere you hide, after you leave that place, Saul comes and wipes everybody out. You feel like you have no place of refuge. You are being besieged on every side. And he has the spiritual audacity to use a word like confident. He said, I'm confident. I am confident of this. Well, what are you so sure about, David? Watch this. Oh, man. Watch this, that I will see the goodness, watch this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the sweet old by and by, when we all get to heaven, when the sweet chariots swing low. No. He didn't say, I'm going to see the goodness of God when we all get to heaven. Watch specifically the language he uses. He says, I'm confident, even though my life is at risk, my life is at peril, fearful times, anxious times are all around me. I got confidence that while I am living, Saul ain't taking me out. This thing ain't going to take me out. In the land of the living, I'm going to see God's goodness. He's going to see me through in the land of the living. Not when I get to heaven, now. I am confident. I'm not just going through, I'm going to be victorious. I'm not just going to be overcome with fear and anxiety. I am going to overcome 
fear, and anxiety. I am confident that in the land of the living, while I still have breath in my body, I'm going to experience God's goodness. That's the man who's not focused on his fear. He's focused on God. Can you say in the midst of what you are facing, can you say in the midst of your fears that you've got confidence in God? You've got confidence in God. Watch this. He says, I, I'm confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he says these magical words. Wait. Your trans, some of your translation says, therefore, wait. In light of the, my confidence that I'm going to see God's goodness while I'm living, therefore, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Watch this. Take heart. Get some gumption about you. Take heart and wait for the Lord. David's faith was realistic. He knew that there was no waving of a magic wand and all his problems would go away. Sometimes as Christians, that's, that's what we think. We think, well, I'm going to pray about it. And when I'm done praying, God, you need to wave the magic wand and you need to make it all go away. Because it don't all go away, God. Something, something's wrong. He knew there was no magic wand. Watch this. this. This word that David uses, wait, he uses it twice. This Hebrew word that David uses here for wait, it's an interesting word because it has an interesting meaning. It conveys the idea of, of, of taking a weak cord, a weak piece of thread, and then entwining and wrapping it around something that's stronger. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Take what's weak. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, Lord, to cuss everybody out. I'm, 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 I'm tempted, Lord, to, 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 to act like everything but a child of God. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to quit. I'm tempted... To, 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 to give up, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to not even seek your presence because it don't seem like you're moving fast enough. I got all these temptations, Lord, because I'm weak. I don't have the strength to face all this stuff, Lord. I've been dealing with it for so long, I feel like just quitting and giving up. I'm weak. Well, if you're weak, here's what David's saying. You're in the perfect position. Take your weakness and wrap it around God's strength. That's what he means by weight. Take a weak cord or thread and wrap it around a stronger rope, thus giving the weaker cord the strength of the stronger rope. Paul said it's something like this. Paul said, I have learned. This is the apostle Paul, y'all. This is the guy that wrote most of the New Testament. This is the guy that was responsible for establishing the New Testament church in the then known world. Paul said, this is one thing I've learned. Paul said, after all the stuff that I've gone through, I've learned to, what's this, to glory in my weakness. To glory, to, he said, to boast about my weakness. Now, now watch this, boast about our weakness. We don't do that. We come around other believers and we fake the funk. You know your fearful times, your anxieties are beating you up. You know you didn't even sleep good last night because you worried about the fear and the anxiety. And you come around God's people, how you doing? Oh, sister, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm above and not below. I'm, you, know, you start throwing out all these Bible. I'm good. I'm it, right? Rather than, what if, what, what if, we, what if we were able to say this? How, how you doing? You know what? I'm weak right now. I learned that in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. I'm trusting God. I'm wrapping myself around a stronger cord. I'm wrapping my weakness around a stronger cord. Paul said, I've learned that to boast about my weakness because in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. His strength, God's strength is made perfect. When we are facing fearful times, anxious times, when we feel surrounded and besieged, we don't have the strength to respond. We have to wrap our weakness around God's strength and wait. 
Let him fix it. Let him turn it around. Let him bring the salvation. Let him be your protection. Stop trying to protect yourself. The more you try to protect yourself, defend yourself, it just gets worse, don't it? Just gets worse. The more you try to fix it, put your little thing to it, add your little wisdom to it and all that, don't go away, get worse. And then you trip it even more because you say, well, what can I do? What? I don't know what to do. Wait. I know how real fear and anxiety can be. And I know all of us here are facing them. We have faced them, we are facing them, and we will face them. The question is, how do we find victory? How do we overcome? I gotta trust God's presence. It's, 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 it's normal when we go through to wanna to call the people we know and surround ourselves with people we know. And that gives you comfort sometimes, right? But they ain't got what God got. They ain't got what God got. So rather than just being in the presence of our friends, we, we have to learn to get into the presence of God. Rather than trying to find protection for ourselves, let God be our stronghold. He will limit what the fear and the anxiety can bring into our lives if we allow him to protect us. He will guard and keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. He will bring us peace. That's the blessings of having a relationship with Christ. If we have a relationship with Christ and when chaos comes, we don't hide ourselves in that relationship, we'll never experience the benefit of that relationship. No Christ, no peace. No Christ, no peace. Some of us, we know Christ, but we don't know peace because we don't turn to him in the midst. We don't wait. We don't wrap our weakness around his strength. I meant to put this video in. I'll close with this. There's a story about the African impala. It's like a deer. Uh, with the long, with the long, with the long horns. And the thing about the African Impala is it can jump, it can jump 10 feet high and at a distance of 30 feet. That thing can, that thing can leap, right? But if you ever go to a zoo, even though it could jump a wall 10 feet high and it, and it could jump a distance of 30 feet, right? Michael Jordan ain't got nothing on them. When you go to a zoo, they can be content. He won't jump over anything that he can't see the other side of. He won't jump over anything. If he can't see what's on the other side of that wall where his feet will land, he won't jump, even though he has the ability. What is our lesson from that? We have to walk by faith.